It's good to be here. Uh, I think this is my fourth time here now, maybe my fifth, I'm not sure. Um, I love being here. Uh, this place is unique, and I hope you realize that. Uh, I've spoken 62 different venues now, and with about four exceptions, I'm usually the youngest person in the Methodist gathering, okay? And this place is just totally blowing the um, top off of that kind of a thing. I mean, you got people in the age groups we aren't seeing in most of our churches, and I think it's great. I just love it. Um, I'm wearing uh, a traditional garb of the people I'm trying to reach. I know missionaries typically do that. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you've seen the back, but it says, uh, I ride with God. And uh, you may laugh at this vest, but I was standing in Walmart, and uh, I was just minding my own business, and the guy tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, and he says, well, do you? And I says, do I what? And he says, do you ride with God? And I says, yeah, do you? And he says, well, as a matter of fact, I don't. And we talked right there in Walmart, and... Uh, uh, went through the gospel, and I'm still in contact with him. And uh, I think I was here before. I told you about uh, crazy things I do to get conversation started. By the way, um, Russ, this is for you. Uh, I'm not going to give it to you, but I'm going to read it to you. But this shirt says, uh, "The secret to fishing is to fish where the fish are." <laughs> Those of you who weren't here when he spoke, you you missed that. But it's an inside joke. Um, but actually, uh, I'm the chair of the conference evangelism team, and that's actually, as far as I'm concerned, my vision for the team. The secret to fishing is to fish where the fish are. The fish aren't in here, people. Fish are out there. And if we want to catch the fish, we have to go where the fish are. Um, did you all get papers? Anybody not get a paper? Okay, two of them. One of them is called uh, recall notice. It's kind of cute. Uh, it's about a human condition and a recall notice from the creator. It's actually... Uh, a fairly accurate way to look at our uh, uh, sin and salvation situation if you read it, and you can keep that for later. The other one I'll probably refer to as I talk, um, it's about uh, uh, a trend that we're seeing as the generations get uh, younger and younger or uh, as the generations grow older and older, if you want to look at it that way. And uh, everything I have to say in the first part of my talk is going to look at that same trend, and it's almost identical. Oh, what else do I want to talk about? So many things. I've got ADD. You know what that is? AD. What's that over there? So I have to have notes to keep me on track. Um, so I've, oh, Max Lucado. How many of you uh, read his book, uh, He Chose the Nails? Anybody? Oh, man, I've been giving that out. That is powerful. The illustrations are so everyday and simple, and they help people understand the gospel message in a way that I would have never thought of. I think it's great. Use all the tools at your fingertips to reach people for Christ. Um, we, we have a call as a church that we're celebrating in this missions conference. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 says we're to make disciples of all nations. Uh, part of my uh, ministry is United States ministry. United States is a nation. We often think of missions as overseas, and it is, and it's a, uh, all nations includes that, but it also includes our nation. And I'm going to talk about why United States needs to be considered in this missions focus that we're doing. Uh, but one of the things I want to talk about is the discipleship. You know, we're to make disciples, not converts. I had that wrong for a long time. Um, we don't make converts. Who makes converts? God makes converts, right? The Holy Spirit. We make disciples. We witness. We testify. God works in somebody's heart. And then we work in conjunction with God's Holy Spirit to disciple a person into the kingdom. And those people, if we do our job right will look like little Jesuses in this world. And we as a church, as we do that, as we disciple people, and we do it right, the church will start to look like Jesus to the world. And Jesus drew the world to him. He was attractive to the world. And I think we need to be too. We don't compromise the message. But the people ought to want what we've got if it's really that good. Um, I've got a little video clip uh, that I want to show. It's by a pastor named Francis Chan. And it's why, uh, how not to make disciples. We'll watch it. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. Right? Most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. <laughs> it, it Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so, okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. 
you, you, you study it, you memorize You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the, our churches are actually making disciples? But they memorized it. You know, I tell my daughter, hey, hey Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. You said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day? and quote everything that he said and talk about how much we know about it. It's just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I'd start making disciples. I want to focus on uh, two things tonight. The first one is uh, why missions to the United States, and then the second one is why house churches. I've been given the assignment to plan house churches as a part of uh, being on staff at Lakeside United Methodist Church in Dubois as an evangelist. So, uh, and, and that's Wesleyan, by the way. Uh, one of the things that made him uh, so effective as an evangelist, there was another evangelist working at the same time as him, uh, but he never included people into discipling groups and you don't hear much about any church that was founded by him or disciples that came from him. But Wesley brought them into class meetings, classes of 50 with lay leaders and, and then uh, pastors who would oversee them. And they had a discipling process. And now we have the Wesleyan movement, all the Methodist churches because of that kind of discipling effort. So it's, it's powerful and it's needed. So to be an evangelist by yourself doesn't make sense. An evangelist is tied into a nurturing community who disciples people. And uh, I happen to have that on my other side of my plate. My other hat is discipling. Um, but United States, why United States? United States is a, a, a rich country, and uh, um, you know we're sending missionaries out. Why have missions to the United States? Why do we do that? Well, there's a number of reasons. I was talking to Pastor Eddie earlier, and I said, I think we're too rich. And we're so rich that we depend on ourselves and our government and our jobs and our social security and everything else. And we don't need any God. We don't need any help. We've got everything we need. And we've been praying as evangelicals for years that we'd have a chance to share the gospel with our nation. And our nation financially, its knees are buckling and people can't trust the government and they can't trust their uh, social security and they can't trust this and they're searching for something. And we're praying, God, fix the economy. <laughs> no, as evangelicals, God, give us power to talk to the people who are hurting and shook and don't have anything to depend on. And give us the wisdom to say the right things so that they turn to you. Use this time. Uh, the combined membership of Protestant churches, these, these figures are 20 years old, and I'm going to give you in the beginning here, okay? So it's worse. Uh, Combined membership of Protestant churches has declined 10% in the last 10 years. United States population increased 12% in the same 10 years. We have a net loss in the United States of 50 churches per week. Less than 40% of residents in any community are in church on any given Sunday, and I know that's considerably less now. A half of all churches did not add one new member through conversion in the last 10 years. Half of all churches in the United States. Uh, there's a growing universalism theology or uh, a thinking in our churches of somehow um, God will take care of them somehow. Well, we don't have to tell them the gospel. But we've been given the commission to, to, to preach the gospel for some reason. It's that important. But somehow we've got it in our head. It's okay. If we don't say anything, it will all work out. It won't. Okay? It's up to us. The Bible tells us that we've been given the keys to heaven. If we take forgiveness to the people, they can be forgiven. If we don't, it doesn't happen. The Kiwanis aren't doing it. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't know of any other government agencies that are taking the gospel out. So if we don't do it as a church, it doesn't happen. So evangelism is in our lap. Um, there's a social gospel focus. Now, I'm not against the church doing social things. They need done. But it comes as a symptom of a changed heart. When God changes people and makes them new creations, then they have a heart of compassion and love for people and help them. But we get it backwards sometimes. We want to do it the other way around. We want people to help people, but we forget the gospel. And the gospel is what changes people's hearts. You can give them a meal and they're fed, 
But if their heart isn't changed, they still are in the same predicament they were. They're still a broken human being, like in that recall notice, and they still need to be fixed, okay? Um, 14 to 40s are largely missing in our churches, not just the United Methodist churches that I just spoke about a little bit ago, but in almost every church, including the Roman Catholic Church, the 14 to 40s are missing. There's two and a half, almost three generations where we have a spiritual vacuum. Uh, 25% of 18 to 30 year olds say they have no church affiliation. That's what we call the millennials. 19% of the Generation X, that's 30 to 39. 15% of the baby boomers, and 10% of the 60 plus. So it's, it's, uh, two and a half times less church affiliation than it was with the, who in here is over 60 with your group, okay? And you, and you'll see that ratio increasing and increasing. You'll see the same thing on that paper I gave you out of the AARP. It's almost the same ratio of change. Um, Younger people who do claim church affiliation will define faith less on biblical truth and more on feelings and what they think. And they'll put a patchwork of mishmash of philosophies and stuff together that has no rational uh, basis, but it makes them feel good and it's okay. And that's how they think. So even though they are affiliated with the church, it doesn't mean it's an affiliation that's Christian or that's uh, based on a faith in Jesus Christ that's biblical. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Okay, so you can talk to a young person and say, are you a Christian? And you'll say, yes, I am. And you'll say, well, did you uh, ever trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? And they say, yes, I did. And I found that it's very compatible with Buddha and something else. And they have no problem mixing that all together uh, and mixing it with any kind of other relationship or philosophy. So, so the figures are worse than they seem to be when I say that's what I'm telling you. Okay, it's not just that change in percentage. Um, church attendance. Uh, same thing, 18% of the 18 to 30 year olds will go to church one time per week. The rest, the other 82% don't. Uh, 44% of the 60 plus people go to church. Okay, there's like a three fold difference between the older generations who are handing us to church and the younger generations who are still in the church, those that are. So even if they are affiliated with the church doesn't mean they quote go to church. Their, uh, uh, habits and patterns of church attendance are radically different. And, and it comes down to another statistic, and I'm not going to keep going through statistics, but they don't feel that uh, church or religious things have a large impact on their life, so why would they give time to it? You see what I'm saying? So it's a whole attitude that's changing of the authority and the power of God in their lives and the need for God in their lives and what they depend on. Um, I'm going to let that go for now. Um, there's a loss of moral base in the United States. Uh, Ravi Zacharias just started speaking seven minutes ago on the foundations of truth, and I'd much rather be listening to him than me, but I don't think we can get Pastor Paul to do that. Uh, but he's talking about how people base their moral values on something. And what is it? Um, I think I told you last time I was here, I was uh, discussing the gospel with a young atheist, brilliant young mind. He's as smart as Ravi Zacharias, 20 years old, going to college in uh, Penn State. And, uh, man, he just whooped me up on the debate side of things. And I finally said something about uh, good and bad, right and wrong. And he got mad at me. He said, you know, I'm sick and tired of you Christians telling me I can't be a good person. I said, define good. And he said, well, he said, that's when a group of people get together and decide what's best for the group and they enforce it. I said, yeah, my, my uh, grandparents belong to a mafia too and they used to do that, you know. <laughs> um, they have no moral base to base right and wrong or good and bad on uh, um, and, and young people coming up, um, they don't know what's right or wrong, except if they think it's right, and the majority does, it's right, and that's it. And, uh, boy, I, I've played that game before with people, and, uh, but we won't go there now. I, I'm going to get off another rabbit trail. Um, one of the things, uh, I'm trying to stay out of politics this time as much as possible on Facebook, I'm building a uh, church on Facebook, if you will, and I'm trying to stay, because there's people on both sides of the uh, the political aisle that attend my Facebook church. and uh, But one of the things I've challenged both sides is uh, to follow the truth, whether you like where it goes or not. Okay, One of the things I'm catching on both sides is they're lying to me through their teeth. They're not telling the truth. I want to start a truth movement. It has nothing to do with politics. I just want people to tell the truth. And uh, I've been working on that. But uh, Pastor Bob, my pastor that I report to, uh, says you can never go wrong following the truth because the Bible says Jesus is truth. And if Jesus is truth and you follow the truth, you're in good hands. So 
Uh, the young people don't have a basis for truth. They don't understand truth. They've rejected the Bible as a source of truth. And so they're kind of floating out there as a, uh, who was it, Malcolm Muggeridge that said the modern man has both feet planted firmly in midair. Um, they, they, just, they just make it up as they go. And when it lets them down, they just change it. That's all. So I, I don't want to keep talking negative about the United States. Uh, Lovett Weems uh, talked about a death tsunami, and I know our bishop has talked about that. And I don't like negative talk. Uh, um, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. You heard about the, the, the guy, a uh, shoe company sent him to Africa, and he came back and said, there's news going there, nobody wears shoes. That's the negative side. And they sent the second guy. He come back and said, send all the shoes you can. There's a market here wide open. You wouldn't believe it. Everybody needs shoes. And that's the kind of person I am, okay? Uh, I see us, like I said before, I see the United States in a position where for the first time in a long time, people will talk about spiritual things. They're open to it. I can start a conversation at Walmart almost any day just by just walking through and talking to people and asking them how their day is going. And when they say something negative, I'll just start leading into a spiritual thing and they'll talk. They don't have a problem with it. It's never been like that before. It's neat. Now, to get them to commit to something, that's tough. Okay, that's different. Or to commit to something as a lifestyle, not just words. And that's part of that discipleship thing we'll talk about. Okay, so why United States? Uh, I think the United States is ripe uh, to be treated as a mission field. I think I said earlier that uh, third world countries are now sending missionaries to the United States. They're actually considering us. We're the third largest mission field in the world right now as far as they're concerned. Um, my life's verse is uh, a quote from my spiritual hero, who's the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, to me, was the greatest evangelist of all times. Um, he did things in his culture that were just unreal. And he said, to, to the weak I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I may by some means save some of them. Okay, And so I am willing to work out of the box and do whatever it takes to open up a conversation with anybody. I don't care who it is. One of the reasons I wear my vest, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I have a little sticker over here. It's the one I like the most. It says, uh, it's not that life's too short. It's just that you're dead for such a long time. <laughs> that one starts conversations a lot. Um, I hang around with uh, guys at the Harley shop. Uh, I went to a funeral for the, uh, uh, the service manager when he died, Paul. And uh, it was a pretty rough funeral. It was interesting. It really was. They were passing around a bottle of whiskey, and everybody was supposed to drink out of a bottle of whiskey and stuff. It was really different. But um, I went to it. Um, didn't really say a lot. Kind of kept back, but just let people know I cared about Paul. And now the people at the shop, they talk to me. And they'll, and they'll hey, Paul, you know, how's it going today? And I'll, I'll tell them how it's going and stuff. And Hey, come over here. I've got to show you this. Here, have got this windshield, and it's got this resurrection scene on it. We thought you'd like that. Hey, thanks. Thanks for showing me that, you know. And so they understand I'm a minister, and they understand that I'm not, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, judgmental. And, uh, and I can relate to them and talk to them, and I've had chances to talk to two of them now. And uh, it's interesting. They'll come to me and tell me problems they're having and stuff. And so I've built relationships. I walk around Walmart. Uh, I told you a couple times a day I'll make a trip through Walmart, talk to people. Um, um, clerks, when I'm checking out, uh, I was telling Patrick earlier about that. Uh, you're checking out in, in Walmart. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a true story. Um, I was checking out, and a lady in front of me was yelling at the clerk for being such a klutz and taking so long and stuff. And when I stepped up, I could tell there was something wrong in this lady's face. Uh, I pray every morning. I told you before, the three open prayer. God opened the door, two opened my mouth, and three opened their heart. And I walked through life like that 24-7. And I said, uh, are you okay? And she says, well, I'll be okay. I said, no, I mean it. I said, something's wrong. Are you okay? She says, I really can't talk. I said, okay, here's my card. Uh, we have a group that meets. Uh, we call it House Church. You're welcome to come if you'd like. Uh, you know, if you need to talk, I'm there. Uh, she came three weeks later. I found out that she had gone home two nights before that, found her dad had shot himself in the garage, and that same night her, her live-in boyfriend of eight years had left her, all in the same night. Uh, her life uh, was shattered. And uh, she's coming to house church from time to time. Her job schedule interrupts with it. But she's trying to rebuild that uh, life again and, and deal with some of those issues. Um, her name's April. Um, I'll tell you more about some other people later. Uh, so why why house churches? 
Uh, young people, the 14 to 40s I'm trying to reach, have a disenchantment with large institutions uh, and organizations, not just churches. Almost all the organizations have the exact same age uh, groups and gaps that we have in the church. Kiwanis do, uh, the vets do, almost everybody. Um, another reason, uh, the young people are not making the big wages that my group made. Okay, I was probably in the prime of the uh, factory and industrialization jobs, and I made good money. And I know a lot of the older people here tended to make pretty good money. And we could support a church and a pastor and all the trimmings that go with it. Okay, a lot of the young people can't do that, and we have to start thinking about that as a church, how we're going to hand off the church to a group of people who make half what we used to make. Um, they may be making two jobs just to make enough to keep their families going. Uh, so uh, financially, are they, are they going to be able to handle a large building with uh, all the overhead? Uh, are, are buildings wrong? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. You guys... You guys' facility is fantastic. I, I, I brag about your kitchen and the gym area. I mean, it is just I just drool over that when I see it. Um, I, I do house churches, okay? And, and I'm a non-building person, but every week after house church, when I'm dragging all my stuff and putting it back in the box to put it away, and I get it back out the next week, I'm thinking, boy, it would be nice to have a building. And I slap myself and catch myself thinking that way. Okay, buildings are nice, but they're a tool, okay? And if the tool doesn't work, you need a different tool. So use your building. Be glad you got the building. But don't worship the building, okay? Do ministry if you have to outside of the building. If the government padlocked those bars like they did in the church in Indonesia, would you be like the pastor in Indonesia who took his people out and they did church in the dirt outside underneath umbrellas because of the heat? And they said, the pastor said, praise God that our church was padlocked. And somebody says, what do you mean? Why did you say that? Well, he says, now the Muslims that walk by here is praying and preaching. And before they couldn't hear it because we were in the building. Okay? Think that way. Start thinking. How can we reach people? What does it take? Um, I have a, I have a microwave that my wife and I got for a couple hundred bucks, but it's an $860 microwave. And uh, I put a plate in it here about three months ago, and I turned the button on, and three minutes later I took the plate out, and it was just as cold as when I put it in. The microwave looks great. It's an expensive microwave. It's beautiful. It fits in the cabinet nice. But the cyclotron that makes the power went bad. And it doesn't work anymore. And I didn't want to get rid of it because it's so nice and it fits the cabinet so nice and it looks so good. And my wife says, why don't you get one of those ones at Walmart for 120 bucks? I said, because it doesn't look as nice. She says, but it works. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Sometimes I'm afraid we get wrapped up in our, our structures and our, our uh, rituals and our church buildings and stuff. And if they don't work, uh, do what works, okay? Don't be afraid to make the change. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with buildings, but don't get wrapped up in them to where you can't do ministry. Oh, boy. I'm running out of time, aren't I? Uh, in house church, and I told you this when I had everybody over here last time I was here and had you sit together. Uh, I, was the, uh, I was one of the charter members of a new uh, church star called New Life Independent, and we met in the pastor's parsonage. And there were 28 of us stuffed in the living room of that parsonage. It stunk from sweat, and we were touching each other shoulder to shoulder. But you know, when the person beside me started sobbing, when the Holy Spirit touched them, I could feel it. And I could put my arm around them and pray with them. Our, our pews, they, they divide us up. They, they were like uh, isolation things to separate us from each other. And it's hard to relate relationally in a church. Uh, we're in house church. We're all jammed together in a room that's about uh, half the size of that stage. And uh, you can tell when somebody's bothered or when somebody's got a problem or something. You just Relationally, you can, you can interact with people. Um, house church tends to be less judgmental. One of the reasons is everybody in there has no reason to judge anybody else, including myself, okay? We've all been there, done that. And uh, I was an atheist at one time, and my life was, I'm not going to talk about it now, okay? But I don't have anything to judge anybody else and nobody else in there. That's one of our rules of our covenant is we're all Christ's guests in this room. We're his guest. We're not my guest or Lakeside's guest. We're Christ's guest. It's his church. And so we treat each other as special people that Christ invited into his presence. Uh, house church is less imposing. I'm an igniting ministry trainer. I have gone to churches to teach them how to be uh, welcoming and inviting and how to do that. And the first time I went to uh, Lakeside United Methodist Church, uh, oh, man, it is beautiful building-wise. I was scared to go in. <laughs> I'm a trainer, and I was afraid to go in the building. It was so imposing. It just made you feel like, I don't deserve to walk through these two big doors. 
Well, how does somebody that looks like me, who, who's had problems in their lives, how are they going to walk through those two doors? I mean, it's, it's scary. It's imposing. It's just, oh. But house church isn't like that. We go in the basement door. It's a youth room with four overstuffed couches, and it's welcoming. Uh, we make sure everybody welcomes everybody, and it, we just work at making people feel like God wants them in his presence, okay? Um, house churches are culturally flexible. Um, I have this dream of reaching Chinese people for Christ in Dubois. Um, I have friends in Brockway who have the Chinese restaurant, uh, uh, Tracy and Andy Lin. And uh, they go to the Alliance Church in Brockway, and I got to fill the pulpit there one time. And I got done preaching, and I was really proud of my message, you know, one of those really good ones you want to take notes on yourself, you know, one of those guys. And I walked up to Tracy, and I said, well, how would you like my message, Tracy? And she was trying to be polite. And she just smiled, and I said, did you understand my message? And she says, no, you talk too fast. <laughs> and then I realized that there are cultural issues that keep people from understanding us that we can solve with culturally arranged house churches with somebody like Pastor said that who's Chinese, who's a Christian, who can explain what I'm trying to get across in ways they can understand it. And so I have a vision. I'm trying to find either a Christian who's Chinese or somebody who's Chinese who Christ is touching that will... Uh, become my uh, facilitator for a Chinese house church. Pray for me on that one. But but uh, house churches can be culturally flexible. They can reach other cultures. Uh, Pastor talked about one he has a vision of too, and I think that's great. Uh, the other thing you can do with house churches, you can flex its time. I talked to uh, Cindy, uh Chinese girl, who's the uh, hostess at Dubois Buffet. And I've spent a year building a relationship with her. Uh, and I just finally got to the point, oh boy, I'm getting off track again. Um, three weeks ago, I went in, two weeks ago, I'm sorry, and she showed me a Bible and says, uh, do you know anything about this? I said, yeah, I said, that's a Bible, it's in Chinese and English. That's pretty neat. She said, well, they gave me these two booklets, too. And I flipped them over and it said, Watchtower. <laughs> and she says, what shall I do? I says, well, I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if it was me, I wouldn't read it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there, okay? And we left it go. And I went in two days ago and she says, I need help. And I said, what's wrong, Cindy? She says, they tell me they want to teach me. How do I tell them no? How do I tell them that it's not the right thing to learn? Okay? Now, I challenge you. Think through that. If, if, you're, if you're good at apologetics, take somebody who speaks broken English with no background in Christianity that you're trying to reach with the truth of Jesus Christ and explain to them why they shouldn't listen to somebody who's teaching them out of the watchtower in 15 seconds. <laughs> That's hard. But... I told her, I said, Cindy, I can't give you a quick answer to that. Will you trust me and let me teach you over a period of time why? She says, yes, Paul, I trust you. It took a year to build that relationship, okay? House church relationships don't come fast and they can go away just like that. You've got to be patient. Okay, other cultures, Marcella shell drillers. Uh, there's a pile of people uh, that are temporary in our uh, area and they work long hours and they're tired. And they need, uh, they need uh, flexible ways to worship if you're going to worship with them. Um, house church by nature is more missions focused than it is performance or entertainment focused. It's just the way it is. We tend to have in church a stage where performers perform and an audience who watch. Okay? House church, we keep everything in a circle and I sit with them so that I'm at the same height and the same position. So we're sharing as a group. I'm not performing for them, and I'm still working on that. i got to break that. Uh, I say, okay, who's going to pray? Well, you pray. Well, why do you want me to pray? Well, you're the prayer in the group. Now, wait a minute, you know. i got to break that. Don't look at me. You know, we're, we're, we're a ministry team together in this house church. God has gifted every one of us with supernatural spiritual gifts so that we can minister to each other. It's just not me, and I'm trying to work through that. Uh-oh. There. My iPad's got dyslexia. <laughs> um, oh, what else? Let's see. Let's skip these. Um, a house church is more easy to maintain during persecution. We had a guy from Saudi Arabia who's teaching English over there, and he had two options to worship. One was to go to the consulate, the ambassador's place. Uh, for a Catholic service, and the other was to go to house churches that were fairly secretive because if you were caught going to church and they found out about it, you would be physically hurt or persecuted. 
So uh, as persecution comes, and I believe it's going to come in the United States, a house church has become very uh, effective at worshiping when there's persecution. Geographically efficient with fuel prices. I need to start one in Brockway because I have some single moms who want to go to house church, but they can't afford to drive to Dubois every week. So I can put one in a house in Brockway with a facilitator with four or five people, and I can start one there to help people worship that way. Um, 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 um. Hey, it worked for 300 years before uh, Constantine, did, by the way. That's how the, the Christian church worked for 300 years. You know, it's, it's not like it's something new. And then, of course, it's Wesleyan. Uh, Wesley had classes with lay speakers and traveling elders. And uh, Pastor has our house churches set up the same way. We're hub churches where I will go between the churches and there'll be facilitators who will be lay leaders who will lead the worship. And then I'll come in and help them with problems or questions and stuff like that. I got one question for you. Pastor, how much time do I got? Am I done? Okay. You, it's him. You don't blame me. He said I could do it. What do you do when your computer gets slow or locks up? Reboot. Oh, I love that. Somebody got it. What do you do when you reboot? What happens? You reset it back to its original parameters when it worked before, right? What do we do when the church gets slow or locks up? Would it be possible to reboot the church back to its original parameters and start it again and start thinking out of the building, start thinking outreach, and start thinking out of the box? The Wesleyan church was built with a focus outside. Um, oh. Let me, let me, let me real quick. I want to just want to tell you about some of our people, okay? Uh, Mike, uh, Mike was struggling with guilt for, uh, uh, three years and talked to me, almost committed suicide. Um, I, I, I explained the gospel to Mike every illustration I could, every way I could. Remember I said, we don't convert anybody? I mean, I gave up my best shot for three years. Everything I could think of. He calls me at a quarter to eleven one night and says, Paul, I got it. God revealed himself to me. I'm forgiven. My guilt is gone. Praise God. That's Mike. Rich. Rich was a 24-7 alcoholic. Rich has been saved for 18 years. Uh, you talk about a man with radical obedience. When God touches him, whatever it is, it just goes away. That's it. But he's got rough rough areas besides that that haven't been touched yet. But when, when God says obey, he obeys. That's all there is to it. Uh, he reaches out to people that I can't reach. He's neat. Tina, his wife. Tina's quiet. She says she doesn't have a testimony. But I've seen a change in Tina over the years. Most people, when I tell them about Tina leading the house church, they said, Tina? Nah, I know her when, and they know her. But I've seen Tina who's changed, and now she has a gift of a prophet. And she can she can tell people things that I can't tell them and reach them. Uh, Rich and Tina are probably going to move to an institutional church. That's one of the things that happens in house church. Uh, God sometimes takes those people, and they move out of house church and go back to an institutional church. Boy, I'm going to hate to miss them. Uh, I'm going to miss them. I'm going to hate to see them leave. But God will use them in a church and, and help change an institutional church around. Robin had a rough life. Robin was a modern-day Job. Uh, she got saved, and about two weeks later, uh, she wanted to go to Haiti when they had the uh, the last big problem with the big... Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I said, why do you want to go there? She says, well, I don't know. There's this passion in my heart that just came in the last couple of weeks. I don't understand it. And those people need help. And I don't know what I can do, but I bet I could help them somehow. God touched that woman's heart. Um, Diana, my wife, uh, she ministers as a lifestyle. Uh, she ministers to kids, and, and I, I don't have patience with kids. And, and our grandkids, uh, uh, they come around, you know, and it's like, okay, settle down, all this kind of stuff. And she says, let's take them to church. And I'm thinking, no, let's go to church and leave the kids in the, the garage somewhere, you know. And, and my wife says, you know, we're the only Christian influence these kids will ever have. See, I'm supposed to be the preacher. <laughs> But she understands that, you know. Tony, Tony's saved and searching for real worship. Uh, he's a neat guy. Linda, young missionary, uh, went to Peru, spent a year there, wanted to become a Lutheran pastor. Um, for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out. She's coming to house church. Thank you, God, for the, pres the gift that you've given to me of her. Uh, she's 25 years old, smart kid. Jennifer, Jennifer went to seminary. She's seminary trained, but not being given to church yet. And uh, she's capable of out-of-the-box ministry. And so I've got I've got a seminary trained person that that uh, works with me. We're going to try to start a group. Uh, Josh Josh uh, had drug problems. A house church gives him accountability, and so he comes to house church. Um, Scott Scott was the one in Saudi Arabia I told you about. Jessica Jessica's my shining star that's broken, but I haven't given up on her. 
Uh, Jessica, I led to the Lord in February. Jessica has been on drugs since she was 12. She's 27 years old. Uh, she has three kids. She lost her kids due to the drugs. Uh, she has felonies. She's been in jail. And in February, I saw a broken person led her to Christ. And she come out, and she was a flaming evangelist, but she got messed up in drugs again. She was reaching out to people that she used to hang with and in the process failed to drugs, okay? And went back to jail, waiting to go to prison, broken violation, uh, broken parole violation. Uh, I went down to see her Thursday, and she says, you know, when I was here last time, I didn't go to church. She says, I'm going to church. And uh, she said, I started out, I was praying with three girls. She says, I got a Bible study going with nine girls. I got a house church going on in jail. <laughs> God's ideas of discipleship are wild. Just follow him and trust him and let him go. Uh, most people give up on Jessica, and I don't look at it that way. Uh, Joy, I've got a guy, a Pentecostal, who's got a four-year engineering degree and a four-year Bible degree, a brilliant teacher, and he comes. And when he does, everybody sits around his seat uh, and listens to him. He's a, he's a neat teacher. Uh, I told you about April, whose father's suicide. Angel, Angel's in college, probably going to be a pastor or a deacon. Uh, Billy's in college, a brilliant kid, going to be an apologist, uh, I think. That's my personal opinion. Melanie's in college. Uh, she's growing in her own faith, thinking of ways to work out of the box to help people. Matt, Matt's still struggling with drugs. He's been dry and clean for a while, but uh, he comes once in a while. Uh, he still needs prayed for. Andrea is 38. Uh, she has MS, found out a year ago. Nine-year-old twins. Single mom. I gave her one of the pizzas you gave me the other night, and she thanks you for it. Andrea is inviting people to come to house church everywhere she goes. Uh, Jaron and his Chinese wife were missionaries to China, planting house churches, and they came to tell us how they were doing it. Encourage us. Angie, Angie's still searching. Angie's fighting drugs. Her husband got messed up on bath salts, and she has a new baby, and she's hurting, and she needs to find Christ. And she comes to house church once in a while, but it just, not yet. I don't get to give her. I wish I could. Uh, Greg is divorced, single dad, uh, busy life. He's dabbling in house church. And Christy, a lady that's going through a divorce, and I've built a relationship with her for uh, almost a year now, and uh, was going to another church, and she uh, Facebook today I looked, and she says, hey, I'll be there Thursday. She says, um, some problems happen. I need a church, and I need somebody that cares about me. Do you care if I come? I says, no, nope, that's what we're about. Come on. House church activities, three minutes, I'll finish up. House church activities in the last 15 months since we started. We did a lay witness mission in... Uh, Hayes in charge. I took a bunch of them out. They gave their testimony. I preached. One of them uh, led music. Uh, we gave $1,000 to Imagine No Malaria. A group of 15 people did that. We gave $600 to Missionary in Peru. One of us did a VIM trip out east. They have a puppet ministry. Uh, we have a Facebook outreach to about 35 people in the background that you can't see or answering. Um, evangelism. We have feedback on about 65 people that House Church has reached through evangelistic efforts. About 45 of them have gone to an institutional church, mainly back to their home church, after God got a hold of their heart, and they went back to their own church. That's great. That's kingdom stuff, and I don't care. That's good. Uh, house church isn't for everybody. Um, we've given out about 1,500 uh, books of uh, Andy Stanley's How Good is Good Enough. I gave Pat one earlier there. Uh, we give out about 100 Gospels of John's. Um, I have six people scheduled for baptism who aren't attending house church now. Uh, actually, five and a half. I think I don't, today it might be six. Uh, Ashley's pregnant, and I think she's due today. So we might have the uh, sixth one today. Um, who else? And I told you about, oh, we have six people in Brockway waiting for Brockway Group to start. I'm going to try to start. I told you about Cindy with the Jehovah Witness thing. So that's where we are. Um, where does house church need God? Uh, this is my prayer request, okay? One of the problems I have, I try really hard not to reach people who already go to a church. I'm not looking to steal people from another church. I actually encourage them not to come. I say, if you do come, see what we do for two or three months and then go back and try it in your own church. Uh, so what happens is the people that come, I don't have a very stable um, theological base or commitment base, okay? They make commitments to Christ, but there's that sanctification, discipleship process that takes a long time to get that stable base where they're able to lead. And so I need, I need that kind of uh, uh, encouragement in the discipleship process to get them there. Um, that's probably good enough. It's a slow process, and I have to have patience. Uh, summary of the whole thing. House churches... Uh, the way we're doing them are lay-led. This is Lady Sunday, by the way. I think this is really appropriate. 
Uh, they're lay led. They're lay spread. I believe evangelism is mainly the job of lay people. I think our pastors are there to direct us and to train us, but I think it's the lay people who are the evangelists for the most part. And then we're a United Methodist clergy um, directed. We have oversight. Uh, there's low risk for the return. Uh, there's very little input needed to start house church ministry. Uh, resources are available for ministry because of the low overhead. And there's a closer discipleship possibility, kind of like Jesus, where you tend to live closer to people so you can disciple them better. Uh, it, it just works that way. So I, I challenge you to consider a lay-led house church as a cultural outreach in your area. Uh, you're doing some great stuff here, and you've got some uh, good people here. Uh, give it a shot. You don't have anything to lose. Uh, don't put it on Pastor Paul's back. Somebody step up to the plate who feels called by God to reach out and reach people. Maybe a team would be best where you have an evangelist, somebody God's calling to be an evangelist, and somebody God's calling to be a, a pastor, and maybe God's calling somebody to be the apostle that's the person that can step out and do the new stuff where it's not being done. And, and maybe you've got a prophet in you that can help them and say the things they've got to hear to help them on their way. And then you've got a teacher to help disciple them and grow them up so they can do the same thing. And put them together as a team of lay people to start a house church. And then if it gets too big, split it and do it again. Okay? That's my dream, my vision. I pray that you've caught it tonight. Thank you. I apologize for taking so much of your time. Amen.